welcome to RIAC. Tonight's program comes from a work camp in England. Now, we don't have work camps in Ireland, but that doesn't mean that Irish workers are not very familiar with them. Father Peter Lamas reports from a work camp in a remote part of the west of England. Until a couple of years ago, there was no more peaceful spot in England than that stretch of land which lies between the River Severn and the little village of Oldbury. But that peace is now a thing of the past, and a strange and almost menacing shape has risen from the ground and towers against the sky. Notices posted along the side of the road warn the traveller that he's approaching the site of a nuclear power station, a place where the rule of no admission except on business is strictly observed. The whole site is surrounded by a high fence designed to keep out unlawful intruders and even the men who are employed on the construction must pass the watchful eye of the security guard before they can start their day's work. It's more like the entrance to a military encampment than to a building site, and the workers themselves look like an army on the march as they pour along the single roadway that leads to their place of work. If they are an army, they're an invading army, for very few of the men who work here are locals. There are men here from every part of England, Scotland and Wales. There are men from overseas, Poland and Pakistan, Trinidad and Jamaica, and there are the Irish. At any major construction site in Britain, you'll often find the Irish outnumbering all the other nationalities put together. This has become so common that it's now accepted as part of the normal pattern of employment in Britain. Very few people ever pause to wonder what are the forces and motives that have caused so many Irishmen to leave their own country and take up employment in a foreign land. What part of Ireland are you from? County Leitrim. And how long have you been in England? About six years. What uh, decided you to come over to England? I think the wanderlust, perhaps. Was it? <laughs> well, were you working in Ireland? Well, I worked for a while there. Yeah, but did, were you weren't satisfied with the job? I wasn't satisfied with the job or the money. What uh, made you come over here? That's obvious, what was it? LSD, was it? LSD, yes. Were you working at home? Well, uh, just for the my father, lay at home. Yeah. On the farm. Yeah, on the farm. Yes. Well, did you learn your trade over here then? You did? Ah, uh, well, that's... You the burning. I did, let, picked it up, like... Tell me, the, how long are you working here? Just two years. What brought you over to England? Well, uh, originally, I don't know. Wanderlust, was it? Wanderlust, more or less. Uh, the job pack up at home, or was the money not so Well, good? I was a farmer's son at home, and I see, see the place was divided up. And, uh, yeah. I was with the sugar company for a while, and we were made redundant, and I came on here then. What part of Ireland are you from? West of Ireland. Whereabouts in Mayo. North? And how long have you been in England? 14 years. What brought you over to work with McAlpine? Well, I suppose like anybody else, come over for a living, you know. Mm. And is the money very much better than it would be at home? Oh, yes. What sort of, can well, you knock back 30 pounds a week in this job? Um, that would be the outside. With overtime? That yes, kind of yes. Apart from making more money, do you think that Irish fellows here have to work very much harder and longer than they do at home? Well, they don't have to, but uh, they tend to work harder and longer. What hours would an average fellow be working here now? Well, I do the hours and on an average. How do you mean you do the hours? This is your job, is it? That's the job. What, what do you call that sort of job? Well, that's the timekeeping. It's part of the timekeeping, oh, you I see. see. Yeah. And uh, the average amount of hours per bloke, I'd say, is over 50 hours. Yeah. That's including the overtime, of course. Yeah. What sort of hours do you work here? Uh, 85 hours in a week. 85 in a week? Yes. That's work on Sunday. Double time it goes, makes up 85 hours. That's about 12 hours a day, or? Uh, 10 hours a day. Well, how do you work out the, the 85? You get double time for uh, the Sunday work, do Yes, you? double time and then time and a quarter in the evenings. Yeah. Works out 85 hours. Well, you must be knocking back a nice uh, few bob in the week at that. About 32 pounds. Wet. That's tremendous money for a 20-year-old. Well, do you save that or do you send it home? Or? Well, I send some of it home and save some. Mm. And what do, you, uh, what do you look forward to in the future now? Oh, uh, just keep on diving, I think. If they do a job within a certain time, like if they're given four days to do a job and they do it in two, well, then uh, they're entitled to the amount of money the, co the company has saved in the yes. two days. Oh, well, there's a big difference in the money. I mean, at home, you're only getting a flat week all the time, and well, whenever you come over here, you're if you work a lot of hours and you get bonus, something that you don't get at home. Yeah. I mean, bonus is a thing you never see at home in jobs at all. Yeah, yeah. Well, the hours would be very much longer, would they? Well, a good bit longer. Sometimes you're doing 70, sometimes 80 hours in a week here, maybe. Is the work harder, actually, apart from the hours well, being longer? The work's not hard. It's not as hard as it is at home. 
Are no. there many Irish lads working under the ground? Oh, there is mostly all Irish. Do you think the Irish fellas are especially good under the ground? Oh, very good. Very Why is good. that? Good workers, you know, stick their job and so on. Don't miss days. And How do you find working here after working on the land at home? Well, I prefer the land. Would you? I would. But more you... interesting. The land is more interesting. Yeah. Those jobs are inclined to become monotonous. Yeah. That uh, you have the one job for the well in the month of June, the same in the month of December. It's different on the fair. Yes. If the pay is good in Oldbury, and there seems general agreement that it is, there's no doubt that it's well earned. The hours are long and the work is hard. The immense buildings of the power station are supported on massive foundations that reach down many feet to the underlying rock. Huge machines grapple with the reluctant soil, boring, tunnelling and excavating to provide a firm substructure for the towering walls of the plant. Strength and solidity are the basic requirements for a power station, which must be strong enough to contain and control one of the most powerful forms of energy known to man, the energy packed into the nucleus of an atom of uranium. The reactor core is the heart and centre of the power station. It's here that the slim rods of uranium will be inserted and allowed to set a controlled nuclear reaction in progress. The immense heat generated by the exploding atoms will be harnessed and used to revolve the turbines which will convert the energy into electricity. As the world's supplies of coal and oil become gradually exhausted, new sources of power have to be sought out, and of these, nuclear power is by far the most important. Oldbury is only one of a number of stations which are going up in different parts of Britain. Much of the work is still at the experimental stage, and each new station to be built differs from its predecessors in many ways as new techniques are discovered and new processes tried out. The Oldbury power station will cost about £55 million before it's completed. In 10 or 15 years' time, it'll be out of date. In 50 years' time, it'll be a historical relic. In the meantime, it will have helped to pave the way for the transition from the coal age to the nuclear age. Still, when one looks at the massive walls and buttresses, it's hard to believe that there's anything transitional about this building. The walls that encircle the two reactors are built of pre-stressed concrete and are fully 15 feet in thickness. More than 3,000 cables crisscross one another in the thickness of the wall to give strength to the structure which is intended to be able to withstand a pressure of 50 tonnes per square foot. When the sound of the siren is heard, the men make their way quickly to the canteen. Men who work hard need to be well fed, and Oldbury has a large and well-equipped canteen to provide them with everything they need in the line of vitamins and calories. The helpings are generous, and though the men make the usual grumbles about the cooking, they give every appearance of enjoying their meals. In fact, a great deal of attention is paid to the comfort and welfare of the men. It's not easy to find men to work on projects of this kind in Britain today. Not only is the work hard, it's lonely as well. As part of a set government policy, nuclear power stations are built only in remote and isolated places, far from any central population. It's not easy to attract men to a job that involves leaving home and family and leading a hermit-like existence in the wilderness for months at a time. The employers are faced with the task of providing not only food for the workers, but living accommodation and recreation facilities as well. To meet these needs, a small town has grown up in the shadow of the power station, a town of long wooden huts that has sprung up almost overnight and will vanish again almost as quickly when the station is completed. This town is called Oldbury Camp, one of the many such camps that have grown up in England beside major construction projects. The huts are weatherproof and well heated in winter, and the individual rooms, each of which holds two men, are neat and clean. Still, it can hardly be described as a home from home, and many of the men prefer to make their own living arrangements. Some have taken lodgings in towns and cities as much as 30 miles from the site. Others have bought or hired caravans in the neighbourhood. But that still leaves about five or 600 men who claim Oldbury Camp as their address, at least half of whom are Irishmen. Are you a single man? 
Yes, single. And do you stay in the camp here? Yes, I stay in the camp. Do you find it uh, a lonely kind of life? Well, not so. No, you have a lot of chaps that you know, you see, and you can yeah. talk to them. And yeah. Then on a weekend, you can go out to the town to see a picture. Yeah. No, not so lonesome at all. Yeah. It's very cut off here, though, isn't oh, it? Oh, it is, yeah. You're backward here. It's about six or seven miles off the main road to see if it last and last at the Bristol. Then. Yeah. Yeah, it's backward all right. Yeah. Did you feel uh, a bit lost when you came over to this camp first? Well, at the start I was, but then I got used to it. Yeah. Well, do you find it lonely living? No, it's quite a few from home along with me. Yeah. It's not too bad. And how do you find life in the camp? It's uh, very good. We went to Bristol four nights in a week, so. Well, uh, you tend to get used to it, you see, when you make friends. Yeah. But, um, you need a car, really, because we're so far away from Bristol. Bristol. We're really out of humanity's reach, yeah, more or less. Are. Very, very dull. You, you live in a cubicle on your own. It's no place for a young man, anyhow, I'm sure. Well, a little bit lost in the end, all right, but now it's all right when you get, once you get yeah. used to it. From the religion point of view, do you find it difficult in any way over here? No, oh, no. Uh, just even more convenient than it is back at home. What about Arthur Guinness? Does a lot of that go down the... Oh, well, it does at times. Yeah. <laughs> Is it a natural, normal kind of existence? Uh, no, it's not. It's, it's, it's... Well, it's not, but uh, it's hard to explain. You, you are isolated, and unless you're one that can uh, adapt yourself to loneliness, well, it would be just a hell of a place, that's all, excuse mm. me for the expression. Mm. But to men that go out and have a drink, I suppose it's not too bad. Mm. But then I think that men living in the camp would normally drink more if they were that way inclined than the men living in digs or a place like that. The only thing is, fair sign concerned, is better than bad digs. Mm. And I have been in some bad digs in my time. Well, I'm living on a caravan site now. Well, it's about seven or eight miles from the job here. It's quite handy and all, you know. Well, is that not very confined for you with the family? And Well, no, it's not too bad at all. A lot of people think that caravan life is confined, you know, but... I mean, we've got plenty of room to roam, uh, roam about and all out around yeah. the caravan site and all yeah. that. Plenty of playing space and all. Well, are the children uh, going to school now? There's none of the children going to school yet. Yeah, there's uh, the oldest one's three and the next yeah. one's two and the next yeah. one's one. Yeah. Well, how how do you look to the future? Do you intend to go back to Ireland? Sometime? Well, the way I look to the future, I'd like to get another couple of years here when the kids start to go to school. I'd like to go back to Ireland again and get them into school in Ireland. Right. Well, I don't fancy them going to school over here. I mean, maybe all right in parts over here, but you haven't got, I mean, Catholic schools for one thing. Um, I'd like them to get into a Catholic school if I could. Are you a married man? Yes. Family? Oh, yes. Are they, are they in Bristol with you? No, no. They're at home in, 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 in Ireland, yeah. That's do, you, do you feel lonely when you're separated like that from them? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes, yes. How often do you get back no. to see them? Uh, every six months. For how long? For two weeks. How old are the children? Uh, I've got one, um, 14 months. That's all. Well, I've got Angela's five and Richard is uh, two. What about school going? School, well, they've got a good school in Bartley, but it's the religious and, and again, there is not so good. Yeah. Uh, it's not a Catholic it's school? It's not a Catholic school, the but uh, the priest teaches them in the evening times, but you'd, you'd sooner if you were in a Catholic school. I know. Are you married? I'm married. I have six, six, six children, have yes. What yeah. age are the children? The oldest is 18, the youngest is five, just to start and going to school. Yeah. And are they over here with you? No, no, by no means, no. I wouldn't have them over here at all at any cost. Would you not? No. Why not? Well, uh, been an awful lot of answers to that question, like, but um, it's dark, I don't it's think it's a suitable qu country to to rear children in the first place from a religious point of view. Yeah. And uh, it's too materialistic altogether. The children have no, or the people themselves have no other outlook in life, only the material side of life. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no, not much family happiness or family unity or uh, mm, that stuff. Home life, yeah. yeah. There are many Irishmen who have made England their home, who have married, settled down and raised their families there. They've become integrated with the people of the country and have enriched the life of Britain with their talents and their industry and their religion. But the Irishmen of Oldbury are not of their number. They show little signs of settling down here, of putting down roots, of acquiring a stake in the country. 
They are men without fixed abode, nomads, who follow the big contractors from one construction site to another. Last year, Port Talbot. This year, Oldbury. Next year, who knows where. To a large extent, the nature of their work forbids any permanent settling down. And there's also the feeling that they have that this work is only temporary, that one day they'll be back in Ireland when things get better, when jobs are more plentiful, when they've saved enough money to start a farm or a little business. Many of them have grown old, waiting for the day they would return, a day that has never dawned for them. Some have remained unmarried. Others have spent the best years of their lives separated from their wives and families, unable to return to Ireland and unwilling to make a permanent home in a country which they still regard as foreign. Have you settled in to, to England, to English life now, after ten years here? Well, a kind of, but the longing is for home. Is it? Yes. Despite the money and the conditions oh, despite, that you have here? Despite the lot, yes. Why? Well, no matter where you go, you still get to know the people all right, but you're always, you always feel like a stranger amongst them. Yeah. But still, you have an awful lot of Irish lads living together here, haven't you? Can you not form a little group of your own? Well, you be forming one every other week because you beat so many lads day here changing. and changing jobs the whole time. Oh, no. Well, have you any plans about going home? Are you saving money to try and get home? Oh, yes, yes. Well, I'd like to settle down at home. Yeah. yeah. Well, what are your plans? Are you going to buy something? Uh, well, farm or something? we'll see later. <laughs> a farm in the Royal Acres of Mead, huh? Oh, yes, we are right. That's where the best of us. Well, you'd have to live on a lot less money over there, wouldn't you, than, you, well, than you'd be getting here? Well, I don't know. The, the rise of in wages over there is coming on. It's closing up to mm. England's mm. wage. Mm. Well, do you hope to settle in England, or do you think you'll settle back in... No, I'll go back home. There. Do you think most of the fellows feel that they'll go back home one day? Well, I think most of them do. Some of them don't. But don't many like of them seem to drift on year after year, yeah. don't they? Yeah, and tend to go home, but never do go. Mm. Have you been home since you left uh, on holidays? No, I haven't been back yet. The money is pretty good, and the work oh, is, is pretty so reasonable. The money is good, and the work is hard. <laughs> Are you going to settle down here? No, I don't intend to settle down here. I'll have my own place at home in Ireland. And are you saving money as you go along? Oh, I try to save something, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, is it successful? Ah, uh, yeah, it's pretty successful. No, no, not if I got a thousand a week, I wouldn't settle here, no. And what do you plan to do? Uh, I plan to stay here for another year, maybe, or 18 months, the longest, and then go home and stay at home. Yeah. I want to get home before the children grow up, you know. Yeah. Well, um, Will you have enough saved when by that time? At the rate I'm going on, yes, I'm doing all right. Mm. I save fairly hard. I can live a kind of a hermit's life for the sake of saving because I miss a lot of things when I'm over here, like shooting and fishing and all the freedom, mm. like the freedom. I don't want to get political now, but we hear a lot about freedom in this country, mm. about freedom of speech, freedom of this, freedom of that, but at the same time, everywhere you go, there's notices up, fishing preserved, shooting preserved, keep off the grass, this is private property, keep off. The only place there's no notice up is in the public house, do you see? So, naturally enough, I don't want that. I don't drink myself, I'm a pioneer. Yeah. So I want to go over, I can have freedom where you can jump in across any man's fence, any place you see a drop of water, and the kids like that kind of a life too, and that's yeah. the kind of a life I want them to like, yeah. not this materialistic attitude towards well, has it helped you to educate the kids by, by the extra money that you get? Financially, them? yes, by all means, yes. As a matter of fact, that's why I'm here. As the youth is there, you see, you tend, you couldn't care less, you see, yeah. where you live. Well, do you, uh, do you think of the future much? Have you, are you, are you not married, are no, you? No, I never think of the future. <laughs> <laughs> I just think of tomorrow, and that's as far as I think. Yeah. You don't live in the camp yourself? No, I live in a firm's house in, in Tombridge. They provide their house for you? Yes. Uh, well, yes. are you quite happy to settle down and live here now? Oh, certainly. My I goodness, I wouldn't go back, really. I wouldn't even go back for the money I'm getting now. Yeah. No, I certainly wouldn't. Well, do you think that a fellow gets better treated in, the, in, the, in an English firm than he would at home? Well, I'm afraid so, much better treated, because when I move, the firm pay all my moving expenses, they provide you with a house. I'm afraid you wouldn't get a cooperation like that at home. There's one man in Oldbury Camp who understands these men's problems. Oh, oh well, without the Irish priest, it would be an awful place altogether. There's no question at all about that, especially when he's the sociable kind of a gentleman we have. He yeah. goes round, he talks to the lads, he comes out in the job and he meets them, and everyone is Mick and Pat and John and Tom. Mm. And mm. There's no. Uh, 
formality about it. Like, they go to him with their troubles, he does letter writing for them, and he gets sailing tickets for them, he arranges air flights for them, and he does all the work for them. They couldn't do without him. Albury Camp has had a Catholic chapel and an Irish chaplain since its beginning. The present chaplain is Father Joe Hogan, who is one of the priests sent over specially by the Irish bishops to minister to the Irish emigrants in Britain. His little wooden chapel is always well filled for Mass on weekdays, and on Sundays, Mass is in the camp cinema to accommodate the large numbers that attend. Father Hogan's parishioners include not only those living in the camp, but all the Catholics that work on the project, however far away they may live, and he often has to travel to places as far off as Bristol or Gloucester in search of straying sheep. No one knows more than he about these men and the strange sense of divided loyalties that hangs over all their lives. Some of these men have been working here for many years. Do they regard themselves as integrated into English life, or are they still emigrants in their own point of view? Oh, they're uh, very much uh, emigrants. They have been away so long from home, and they stay so short in any particular area that they really don't have a chance to settle. Uh, they're never uh, really... They get another geography of the place, of course, mm. and uh, they could name out tremendous lists of places they've been and, mm. and the houses they've sort of stayed in, streets they've lived in for years and so on. But in general, they are uh, they belong to no place in this country. Yeah. Well, do you try and encourage a, a sense of provision for tomorrow amongst them and to try and make them decide either to settle here or to go home? Uh, speaking to them individually, yes. Of course, it's not a thing you could preach at Mass. Yeah. But uh, speaking to them individually, especially those who really have no hope of going home because of the part of the country they live in or because they don't have a trade or because they have, we'll say, a big family to support at home and therefore they'll never be able to...